God will judge Jews according to their works, judging whether they obey the Mosaic law. Because they have broken the Mosaic law, they will be condemned. And being physically circumcised will not grant Jews immunity from God's condemnation. Verse 1. Therefore, what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. For firstly, they were entrusted with the utterances of God. Based on the previous section, Paul may be misunderstood as teaching that the Jews, represented by physical circumcision, had absolutely zero salvation advantage over the non-Jewish nations, which is false. In fact, Jews have many salvation advantages. Firstly, God chose to entrust his utterances to the Jews. God's utterances refer to the entire Old Testament scriptures, including the Mosaic law, and not just God's promises of salvation. So everything in the Old Testament scriptures is considered God's utterances. For example, Acts chapter 7, verse 38 takes it as referring to the Mosaic law. And God's utterances, the Old Testament scriptures, reveal God's way to eternal life. Nothing is more important than knowing God's way to eternal life. And God entrusted this truth, this eternal life-giving truth, to the Jews. What other people had this salvation advantage? None. All other peoples who want to know God and enjoy eternal life have to come to the Jews to learn from the scriptures entrusted to their care. So Jews were entrusted with God's utterances, the first massive salvation advantage. But if you notice, after Paul stated the first Jewish salvation advantage, he stopped there. Wait, Paul, where's the second, third, fourth advantage? What happened to much in every way? Is there only one Jewish salvation advantage? No. Jews still have more salvation advantages. Paul simply stated the first Jewish salvation advantage and paused to clarify. Remember, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight and saved from his wrath on judgment day simply for having God's word, for hearing God's law, but failing to do God's law. So why can't an unrepentant Jew say on judgment day, God, I knew your word from childhood. All my life, I read it again and again and again. Fine, I admit I disobeyed you in X, Y, Z, these areas. But does all that knowledge of your word count for nothing? How can you condemn me? Next comes Paul's answer. Verse 3. For what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? May it never be. Rather, let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be righteousified in your words and will prevail when you are judged. Well, not every single Jew was unfaithful to God's word. After all, there were Jews who repented from their sins, obeyed the truth by believing the good news. That's why Paul said, what if some, not all, some, what if some were unfaithful? Paul excluded 
Jewish disciples of Jesus from this criticism of Jewish unfaithfulness. Paul excluded Jewish Christians from this criticism that Jews were unfaithful to God's word. Paul's criticism focused only on Jews who were unfaithful to God's word. They broke the Mosaic law. They refused to repent from those acts of law-breaking, from their sin. They refused to obey the truth by believing the good news concerning God's Son, even though this good news was prophesied in God's word in his utterances. This is the meaning of they were faithless to God's word. But God does not imitate Jewish unfaithfulness to his word. God's faithfulness to his own word is never nullified. God always remains faithful to his own word. God is always true to his word, even though everyone were a liar. Here's a question. What does it mean that God remains faithful? Remain faithful to do what? Answer. God promised to bless his people if they obey him. God also promised to curse his people if they disobey him. God remains faithful to both promises of blessing and cursing. Since Jews have unfaithfully broken God's law and refused to repent and believe the good news, then God will faithfully keep his word and curse them for their disobedience. God is righteous. He always keeps his promises, even promises of judgment on sin. Visit Nehemiah 9, verse 32 to 35. Visit Lamentations 1, verse 18. Check Daniel uh, chapter 9, verse 1 to 19. God always keeps his promises, even promises of judgment on sin, on sinners, unrepentant sinners. So even if everyone lies and does not keep God's word faithfully, God remains truthful. What he says, he does. Paul quoted Psalm 51, verse 4 to show that God is always proven to be true and righteous in punishing liars and the unrighteous. In Psalm 51, King David admitted his sins and confessed that God is righteous in punishing him. King David confessed he had no valid grounds to accuse God of wrongdoing when God punished him. King David did not make excuses, but God, I am circumcised. You can't judge me for my sins. But God, I know your scriptures. You can't judge me for my sins. Similarly, Paul's Jewish opponents have no grounds to accuse God of wrongdoing when God punishes them for their unrighteousness. They have no valid excuses. <coughs> so if they accuse or sue God for being unrighteous when he punishes them, they will lose their court case. God will prevail over the accusers who judge him, who accuse him of unrighteousness. God will definitely be proven to be, to be righteous when he punishes Jews for their unrighteousness. King David was an ideal role model for Jews to imitate. He acknowledged God's righteousness in punishing him for his sins, for his unrighteousness. King David was an ideal role model, but not all Jews followed King David's humble example. Verse 5, But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. When Paul says our, when Paul says we, Paul is referring to himself along with his fellow Jews. So Paul's point was, Jews are unrighteous, therefore God punishes them, and therefore God shows that he is righteous in judging Jews for their sins. 
However, Paul's Jewish opponents reframe the entire, this entire chain of logic. They reframe it like this. Okay, Jews are unrighteous. Yes, we have sinned. Well, it shows that God is righteous. And so we have done God a favor. After all, our sin is the occasion for God's glory since he gets to display his righteousness. Right? When he punches us, he gets to display his righteousness. He, he shows how gloriously righteous he is. So, God is unrighteous when he turns around and inflicts wrath on us. After all, we did God, we did God a favor, didn't we? We sinned so that he can punish us and then show that he's righteous. So, how can he punish us? Isn't he unrighteous? We did him a favor and this is how he repays us? This is the Jewish opponents unbelievably illogical uh, counter-argument to Paul. And Paul absolutely rejected this Jewish opponent, uh, opponent's argument. He clarified that what he just said in verse 5 was a paraphrase of his opponent's argument. Notice he said, I speak in a human way. That's not what he really believes. He's paraphrasing his opponents. This was his opponents, merely human argument. It was not Paul's argument, and it was not a valid argument at all. So after presenting his Jewish opponents, a merely human argument, Paul firmly rejected it. Verse 6, may it never be. And then he goes on to rebut their ridiculous counter-argument. Paul's rebuttal, number one. The Jewish opponents are self-contradictory with respect to the unrighteous nations. Verse 6, May it never be. For then, how could God judge the world? Let me unpack this logic. You see, Jews acknowledge that God is righteous to punish the nations, the world, non-Jews. God is righteous when he punishes them for their unrighteousness. That's what they were saying already, thinking already, as Paul recorded in Romans chapter 2, verse 3, as the Old Testament scriptures already recorded in Psalm 97 to 98. Yes, Jews all believe that God is righteous when he punishes the unrighteous non Jewish nations. Since that is the case, how can Jews turn around and then accuse God of unrighteousness when God punishes them? for their sin. So Paul brought this up to expose the hypocrisy of his Jewish opponent's position. The nations are unrighteous. God is righteous to judge. And the Jewish opponents agree with him, with Paul. Next scenario, Jews are unrighteous. God is righteous to judge. Paul believes that to be true and it is true. But suddenly, Jewish opponents disagree. Nations unrighteous, God is righteous to judge. Jews unrighteous, oh, God suddenly is unrighteous if he judges Jews. This is lies, hypocrisy. That's Paul's rebuttal number one. The Jewish opponents are self-contradictory with respect to the, non, to the unrighteous nations. Paul's rebuttal number two. The Jewish opponents are self-contradictory with respect to Paul's so-called unrighteousness. Paul's so-called lie, verse 7 to 8. But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being judged a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, when Paul says my, when Paul says I, he's referring to himself. You see, Paul's good news was often misrepresented by his opponents. They called his good news lies. They misrepresented his teaching as, why not do evil that good may come? According to Paul's opponents, mainly Jewish in this case, he was preaching lies and he was a sinner deserving God's judgment. So Paul brought this up to expose the hypocrisy 
of his Jewish opponent's position once more. Paul says, truly, Jews are unrighteous, God is righteous to judge Jews. But Jewish opponents disagree. Yet, Paul's opponents slanderously say, Paul is a lying sinner. God is righteous to judge Paul. Suddenly, Jewish opponents all agree that it is righteous to pour out wrath on this, uh, on, on this Paul. So, Paul's Jewish opponents say God is unrighteous to condemn them for their sins. But they clearly think God would be righteous if he condemned Paul for his so-called sin of preaching so-called lies. Once again, inconsistent, hypocrites, liars. So in verse 8, Paul was not done. In verse 8, Paul exposed their twisted logic one more time. His opponents misrepresented Paul's good news as a do, good, a do evil that good may come message. Well, obviously, if that, that is true, if that is true, then Paul is indeed a false teacher. If that was true, it is not true. Obviously, Paul did not preach do evil that good may come. Instead, his opponents misrepresented his teaching. They slandered him. So now, Paul took this misrepresented caricature of his teaching, do evil that good may come, and turned it against his opponents. Here's how. His opponents' twisted logic in verse 5 went, our Jewish unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God. Right? He punishes us, then he looks righteous. Thus, God is unrighteous to condemn us for our sins. Paul pointed out that their twisted logic actually implies why not do evil? Why not be unrighteous? That good may come. After all, it serves to show the righteousness of God, right? So, if we just take a step back, didn't we just say a moment ago that Paul's opponents didn't agree with this do evil that good may come message? Otherwise, they would not have caricatured Paul as preaching that lying message and then criticized him for it. So obviously, they do not agree with do evil that good may come. They just transferred the blame to Paul. That's what Paul says. He obviously didn't. But since they disagree with this statement, do evil, that good may come. Why then did they use this twisted logic in verse 5 as a lame excuse against Paul's warning that God would judge them for their unrighteousness? You see, on one hand, they say that Paul is using this logic and they rejected it. When they are in trouble, when Paul is saying, you're going to be judged for your unrighteousness, Suddenly, they, they turn around and forget that they criticized that point of view earlier. They turn around and say, Oh, our unrighteousness, we did the evil, so that good may come, so that God may look righteous. So He owes us, right? We did evil, you know, so that He can, sh he can show His righteousness when He punishes us. So he, he can't actually. He can't punish us. Yes? We did Him a favor. Obviously, if you are feeling like, what on earth are these people talking about? How could you even think that? That doesn't even make sense. Yeah. Lies never make 100% uh, consistent sense. There's only some element of truth. And then after that, there's a mismatch. Something doesn't add up. So let me just repeat myself. Paul's rebuttal, he two of them. Number one, the Jewish opponents are self-contradictory with respect to the unrighteous nations. Verse 6. Paul's second rebuttal, the Jewish opponents are self-contradictory with respect to Paul's so-called unrighteousness, Paul's so-called lie. That's verse 7 to 8. At the end of the day, Paul's opponents refuse to repent from their sin and obey the truth by believing Paul's good news. They just refuse to do so. But, as with many, you want to sin, but you don't want to face the consequences. And you don't like people to tell you that there will be consequences. So, when they are in this situation right now, when they have unrighteousness on their record, but they do not want to repent from it, 
They do not want to humble themselves, obey the truth, believe Paul's good news, the true good news, Paul's good news. What, have, what do they have to do? To cover up. Well, resort to lies. Well, deny that God will judge them for their unrighteousness. Twist logic. Apply inconsistently. Add lie upon lie. And to further damage Paul's good news, slander Paul, misrepresent his message. These are the tactics that people use when they are caught in a corner. So Paul concluded that judgment is just. And likewise with my opponents, I know they are not Jewish. I know they don't exactly use the same arguments as these Jewish opponents of Paul. But there is some similarity. After all, they claim to be God's people. In fact, in some ways, they are worse than these Jewish opponents. At least these Jewish opponents will not accept the good news outright. They will not accept Jesus as the Messiah, as the Anointed One, as the Son of God. My opponents, <laughs> they claim to believe everything that I just said, Jewish, the, that Jesus is the Son of God, ruling at the right hand in power. But somehow forget that that implies that they need to obey the commands of that person they believe is ruling in power. And somehow it doesn't click that if they disobey the commands of that individual, the most powerful person, the ruler of heaven and earth, delegated authority by God the Father, it doesn't click that if they dare to disobey him like that, flagrantly, defiantly, without repentance, Resorting to lies, who truly is their master? Not Jesus. So in some ways, they are even worse than Paul's Jewish opponents. At least Paul's Jewish opponents said outright, I do not accept Jesus as the anointed one. These people say Jesus is their king, but proceed to just throw his commands out of the window. So likewise with my opponents, they claim to be God's people. They refuse to repent from sin, yet they deny that God will judge them for their unrighteousness. How do they deny the undeniable? By using twisted logic, by slandering me. And so likewise, likewise, the judgment is just, and even more so than Paul's non-Christian opponents.